Let's start with a presentation on dealing with out of control, you and your aircraft. Uh, again, I am BJ Ransbury, I'm the president of Aviation Performance Solutions, and we're going to be talking about how you as the pilot interface with your airplane, not only through your hands-on control of it, but through decision making, and how we as pilots, by better understanding the threat uh, areas where we are vulnerable is that we can be more effective at overcoming loss of control and really the primary goal is to stop it in its tracks before it develops. So there's five sections to the video presentation that we're going to go through. The first one is revisiting back to the video scenario. Now you can watch this video uh, on its own and it's very, very powerful and it's very obvious some of the learning areas. Uh, but what we are going to do is we're gonna focus right in to the point right where the autopilot fails on approach and we can start hearing the system calling pull up, pull up, primarily as a terrain avoidance protection. And we're gonna take it from that point forward to talk about loss of control in that section. Number two, we're gonna have a brief industry update so you can understand where the industry is and where it's going today. Uh, the third section is what's called the upset training paradox. And interestingly, there's a common theme uh, for experts that are wanting to overcome loss control in flight. There's a few approaches, but primarily it boils down to this, is that there's the camp that focuses on prevention and there's the camp that focuses on recovery. Now what the upset training paradox is, is it's not at all clear where prevention ends and recovery begins. In fact, a full solution addresses not only prevention and recovery, but also awareness. In fact, there's a full spectrum or layers of mitigation associated with loss control that starts with your knowledge, not only of your airplane, but the environment and the areas and threats and causes of airplane upsets, which lead to loss control for you to be able to overcome. And so we're gonna talk about that that paradox between where prevention ends and recovery be begins. You would think it would be a very clear distinction, but it's not at all, and we're going to talk about that. Uh, number four, errors and attitudes. Uh, in other words, how can we survive a loss of control and flight event when we ourselves as human beings have human factors that in many ways work against us being effective to overcome loss of control and flight? The final section is now that we've had our opportunity we could have prepared better. We could have made better decisions. It could have been a situation where leading up to loss of control and flight event where, yes, through better distraction management or pilot monitoring in a cruise situation, that we should have overcome the event. The problem with loss of control is once the airplane upset happens, which is a precursor to loss of control and flight, it doesn't really matter how you got there and what you should have, could have, would have done had you been looking at this as an academic or looking at a video or sitting in a classroom. You are there in the airplane real time in a situation where the airplane is on its way to out of control. And how do we snap out of whatever got us there to take effective action? And that will be the last section of the presentation, which I think you're going to find very interesting. So loss of control in flight. And you can see the question is, it, it's much better now, right? Well, you would think that after all these years, in fact, loss of control in flight and controlled flight and terrain have been going back and forth since the beginning of recording aviation accidents by the Boeing company in 1959. And you would think now that we'd be much better at addressing loss of control in flight. Well, the problem with loss of control in flight is that there's not really a very easy technological solution. Uh, it's a situation that is very often pilot-centric, although pilots are not the only cause of loss of control. There's other factors which we're going to talk about. But the issue is that the statistic is prevalent almost to the point where we get comfortable with the statistics. But here's the problem is it's not getting better. Let's take a look at the statistics from uh, 2005 through 2014. So the report that was issued that was analyzed during the NBAA Safety Committee presentation that we gave on the single pilot safety stand down in 2015. So here it is. Here's the loss of control in flight. And this is for the commercial industry, but that shape, that characteristic shape of the curve with loss control being dominant at the beginning and everything else being, you know, being smaller than contributing to the right is a very common shape irrespective of where you actually look in aviation, whether it's general aviation, whether it's commercial, whether it's business, whether it's instruction, whatever it might be, loss of control in flight is prevalent. 
So that's it. That's the big column on the left. And very often when you look at accident statistics, the cause factors that you'll see, loss control, is out there on the left. So the problem is, is that it would be fine if we were slowly going down and getting better at it. But when you compare this chart that we're looking at right here with the exact same chart the previous year that covered the, the time period of 2004 to 2013, we actually see that the number of fatalities associated with loss of control in flight has gone up by 8.5%. And now for the first time ever in history, loss of control in flight is twice as big as the next category, which is shown here as controlled flight into train. Now, there's good news, bad news associated with that. The bad news, of course, is the fact that it's getting worse and it's double the next category. The good news, though, is something like controlled flight into train. The reason why it's going down and really highlighting loss of control is because of the advent of the technology and tools in the cockpit for pilots to be more aware of their situation. And certainly there's opportunities to help loss of control in that way. Uh, and we will talk about that later in this series of videos that you are watching. The top three safety focus areas, and this particular one uh, is statistics drawn from ICAO, but the whole point of this, this is different statistics than we saw in the previous chart, but let's go ahead and take a look at a few things. You see how the orange is the number of fatalities, and the blue is the number of accidents, and correction, uh, fatal accidents, and then the dark blue is the number of accidents. Let's take a look at loss of control specifically here. Because when people think about accidents, very often runway excursion or runway safety related scenarios come to the top of their, of their thinking and rightly so. Take a look at the number of accidents in runway safety situations. It is the top one. It's 50% of the accidents right there. And look at the fatal accidents. Of the fatal accidents, it's, it's a quarter, 25% of them. But now you take a look at loss of control in flight, and it's only a meanly 2%. But here's the problem with loss of control, is it's very lethal and very fatal. Even though it is 2%, it contributes to 25%, the most number of fatalities in aviation of any other category. And in fact, the updated version of this chart shows us between, between 40 and 50%. So it's gone up again. So loss of control in flight is really an area that we need to pay attention to. But it doesn't happen very often. But when it does happen, it's very lethal. And of course, lethal meaning fatal. So... Let's go ahead and take a look at our scenario now. What we're going to do is we're going to take a look at the video and we're going to bring it all the way up to the autopilot, autopilot, and we're going to hear pull up, pull up, the situation that is a precursor just prior to the airplane going out of control. So before we do that, and we, we've been talking about some terms here that uh, is, is kind of difficult for us to, to understand very clearly without actually knowing what loss of control in flight is, because we talk about it, but it's not really prevalent when we go out and we talk to groups that they truly understand what loss of control is and where is it in that spectrum of taking effective action when it comes to us as pilots sitting in the airplane or planning for our mission. So let's take a look at a couple definitions. So the definition by uh, ICAO and CAST and EASA is it's an extreme manifestation of a deviation from the intended flight path. Yes, absolutely, it, it would be that. Let's take a look at another definition. Well, here's the media. It defines it as an adverse flight condition placing an airplane outside of the normal flight envelope with the inability of the pilot to control the airplane. Look at that last part. With an inability of the pilot to control the airplane. So if we're here to overcome loss of control in flight, would everybody agree that if we wait for loss of control to happen, we've waited far too long? We are not in control anymore. We as the pilots need to be able to take action early. The question, of course, is when is that? How do we know that we're on our way to a loss of control in flight scenario? What precursor situation or set of conditions helps us to identify that? Well, that's going to be the introduction of the concept of called an airplane upset. So an airplane upset is defined, and this is defined by the Airplane Upset Recovery Training Aid, the FAA and ICAO all define it the same way, and it's this. It says, while well, specific values vary among airplane models, the following generally describes an upset for aircraft, okay? Pitch greater than 25 degrees nose up, all right, 25 degrees nose up, 10 degrees nose down, and just 45 degrees of back. 
Okay, now we would admit as pilots that that is not very severe, but it doesn't matter about the severity. What I want you to think about is think about your day-to-day -day operations. Unless you're uh, flying with some type of a law enforcement organization or the military or flying aerobatics, think about when you're flying your airplane from A to B with your family or your passengers or your customers on board the airplane. How often do you intentionally exceed 25 degrees nose up, 10 degrees nose down, and 45 degrees of bank? Likely never. It's very, very rare. But see how it says that they may vary among, uh, among airplane models? Let's say you're in a very high thrust uh, airplane that has a 27 degree nose up pitch attitude. It doesn't mean this doesn't apply. It means that you have to set criteria that are unique to you. So your definition of airplane upset may be 30 degree does nose up because it's a situation which is outside the normal operations of your airplane. The point is, is that you as a pilot need a set of parameters that cues you to start taking effective action to overcome a situation that is unintended. Now remember, exceeding these parameters is unintended. So if you take your airplane out and for some reason you want to do a 60 degree bank turn just to show your family what 2G feels like, well, that's not an airplane upset because it wasn't intentional. It doesn't mean it's the right thing to do or necessarily the safest thing to do, depending on your experience level. But the point is, is that this is unintentional. Now, there's another aspect of airplane upsets, and it's this. It's within the above parameters, but flying at airspeeds inappropriate for the conditions. So what's an inappropriate airspeed? Would everybody agree that a stall is? Okay. How about slow flight when you don't intend it? Absolutely. How about high speed? What if you're approaching or at VMO or beyond or MMO for jet pilots? Is that an airplane upset? It absolutely is because it's inappropriate for the conditions you're flying in. And again, remember that it's unintentional. It's a situation that happens without your intent to do so. So that is the definition of an airplane upset. So here's the question. Is a stall an airplane upset? It absolutely is because it's an inappropriate airspeed. But what we are going to learn in this presentation that really it's not so much about speed when it comes to stall, even though speed matters, is it's more a function of angle of attack. And we're going to talk about that in more detail. So remember, inappropriate speed is just not the stall. It could be uh, unexpected or unintended slow flight or high speed as well. Okay, so why does the airplane upset matter? These conditions as the pilot that you need to program into your brain, when these occur unintentionally, they have to prompt you to say, okay, whatever I was doing before does not matter anymore. I have to focus on getting the airplane back into the heart of the envelope. What is the heart of the envelope? That's for you to decide. Is that five degrees nose up, zero bank? Uh, at uh, L over D max or higher at your speed stable range of airspeed? Or is it simply getting it to less than 25 degrees nose up and 45 degrees of bank? It doesn't really matter other than the fact that you recognize these parameters occurring and you take effective action while you are still in control of the airplane. That's critical. Loss of control is typically a situation where the pilot is no longer in control of the airplane or no longer reliably in control of the airplane. We as pilots have to take effective action way before that. And that's the value and importance of the definition of the airplane upset.